Again, welcome to Biostatistics. Today's topic is inference about a mean, which is unit 11 lectures or chapter 11 of our course textbook. So our main objective is to estimate the standard error of the mean, also students' T distribution, one sample T test, confidence interval for the mean, peer samples, condition of inference, and also how to find the sample size and the power of a test. So in our, our prior lectures, uh, lecture unit eight, nine, and 10, we rely on the Z test, the Z statistics test, that's the Z procedure to help infer the population mean. Now, Z procedure in turn rely on knowing the value of the population standard deviation before data are collected. But this lectures, again, Unit 11, we introduce a method that do away with this often unrealistic condition, that's knowing the population standard deviation. So with Z procedure, population standard deviation is used to calculate the standard error of the mean using the formula, again, uh, population standard deviation of a square root of sample size. But in this lecture, we are going to replace the population standard deviation with the sample standard deviation to find the standard error. So here we have S, which stands for again, sample standard deviation. So instead of using, using S, instead of using the population sigma standard deviation, would have a source of uncertainty. And this, again, makes us to do away with the Z procedure. So the D procedure is no longer applied. Now we're going to use the T procedure or the T test. So a T test is a family of distribution that identified by student. This was introduced by William Silly Gossett in, again, 1908. So using, again, the sample standard deviation to estimate the standard error of the mean, tax on the additional element of uncertainty to inferential procedure. And this will accommodate additional uncertainty. So we use, again, a T distribution instead of standard normal Z distribution when making inferences. T distributions also resembles the standard normal distribution. They are also a bare shape and centered on zero. So again, T distribution also is a normal curve. But however, T distribution have more area in their tails than the standard normal Z distribution. Then this will again broader the tails which accommodate the additional uncertainty that comes with estimating, again, population standard deviation with sample standard deviation. So again, T family members are identified by their degree of freedom and also T distribution are similar to Z distribution as we said earlier, but with a broader tails. The broader tails make the T distribution and put the T distribution in uncertainty uh, position. So one thing is that as the degree, the DF stands for degree of freedom. As the degree of freedom increases, the T tails get skinnier and T becomes more like Z. So this is the diagram to show. So again, T distribution is almost the same as Z distribution when it comes to the type of, again, they are all normal or bear shaped curve. But we can see that as the degree of freedom increases, the tail, the broader tail, becomes more skinner. So it becomes almost uh, like a Z distribution. So, T distribution table here, we want to understand how to use it. Now, to use the T distribution table, and to look out for the T values and probabilities, first, we need the degree of freedom. 
also we need to have a t value then the columns will be the probabilities the rows is the degree of freedom and this is an example here so in our textbook table c is the t distribution table so we can see the columns these columns again probability so probability of uh, if we are doing upper tail 0 0.25 0 0.20 0 0.15 0 0.10 etc so the columns are the probability and here we have only one row that is the degree of freedom at the row so degree of freedom again will start from 0 1 2 3 i mean 1 2 3 etc so here we have a row 9 or the degree of freedom from 9 so if I know the P and I know the degree of freedom, then I can find the T value. Or if I know the T value and I know degree of freedom, then I can find the P and the P. So the P are the columns. Sometimes, for example, I may get a T value, which is one point, let's say 1.6. So it will fall between one point, and also the degree of freedom is nine, always degree of freedom is important. Now, if the degree of freedom is 10 or 20, then we go different road. So let's assume the degree of freedom is nine, and then the T value is 1.6. So this means it will fall between 1.383, 1.833. Now we have to know what, what type of uh, testing we are doing. Are we doing the, looking for the cumulative P or upper T P or two-way testing? So if it's the upper T P, then our answer will be 0.10. Uh, if it's about cumulative, then 0 0.90. So I, I had decided to take, I have 1.5 less roughly, and I will take 1.83 to find the P, or I will take 1.833 to find the P. So this is example given. For example, we have a T value. The degree of freedom is 9, and uh, alpha or the probability is 0 0.90. So this means I'll go to the ninth row and I'll go to the cumulative, here. this is for cumulative P, then I'll go to the color for 0 0.90 for cumulative. So which means the answer will be 1.383. The same thing if I have 1.383 and I know the degree of freedom, I can also find the P. So again, always when we are using the t distribution table the first value we should know is the degree of freedom if i'm looking for t value then i should know the p also the p's are the columns degree of freedoms are the rows now if i know the t value and i'm looking for p i still need the degree of freedom then i'll go top to the column select so here we have the 10th and the ninth percentile on t9 as we saw earlier we saw the cumulative and then the upper tail, so 0 0.90 and 0 0.10. The total for each column for the cumulative P and upper tail P will be one. Each is one. So here we have the left tail will be negative 1.383 to the right tail will be positive. 1.383 because the center will be zero. So this is almost the same as the Z distribution. So in the right table, we say the probability T9 is greater than 1.383. So it's go to the right side. Here it's lesser, so you go to the left side. So now let's see how we can use the T distribution to test an hypothesis. Again, the main goal of using the T table here is because we don't know the population, the population standard deviation. We can see that the formula for the T statistics is sample standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. So because we are using the sample standard deviation, we cannot use the Z testing. We have to use the T testing. So the steps for the hypothesis is almost uh, testing, it's almost the same as our previous two lectures. So first hypothesis testing, we claim our HO and HA. So here we say the HO, the mu equal to mu zero, 
versus HA, the mu not equal to mu zero. So equal and not equal is two-sided. Or we may have the left-sided, which is the mu should be less than mu zero, or the right-sided, the mu should be greater than the mu zero. So those are the three options. The next step, we look for our test statistics. So here the formula, we have the, almost the formula is the same as our previous testing. Now the difference is that we are using the sample standard deviation. And that lead us to again, the concept of using the T test. So it will be the sample mean minus the mu zero or the population mean divided by the standard error, which is the sample standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. Then we need to find a degree of freedom. Degree of freedom is n, which is the sample size minus one. So when we know the degree of freedom and we know the t, t value, we can again find the p value. So next, we find the p value by converting the t stat to p value. Either we use the t table in our textbook is table c, or we can use the software. Now, when we have a small p, as previously, it's always strong evidence against HO. If the p is bigger or equal to alpha, then we have a weak evidence against HO. And that's the significance level, the alpha. So let's see one example here. Here we have a one sample t-test, the statement of the problem. Our question said, do SIDS babies have lower than average birth weights? That's our question. Now we know from our prior research that the mean birth weight of the non-SIDS babies in this population is 3,300 grams. Now we study a sample of 10 SIDS babies that we determine that their, their birth weight and then we can pay the S bar, which is 2890.5. And then the sample standard deviation, which is 720. Now our question said, do this data provide significant evidence that SIDS babies have a different birth weight than the rest of the population? We can see that we can do hypothesis testing here using T distribution. Why? Because the sample standard deviation is given, not the population. We already know that our hypothesis for HO, the population mean here is 3300. We know the X bar or the sample mean, which will help us to find the T test value. So let's go through the steps. So our null hypothesis, we know the population mean, so the mean is 3300 versus the mean is not 3300, so we're doing two-sided. Our test statistics, the sample mean is given, which is 2890.5, minus the population mean, which is 3300, divided by the standard deviation of the sample was given to be 720, and the sample size we are using is 10, so square root of 10. So using our calculator, we will get negative 1.80. This is again t-testing, so we need to find a degree of freedom, which is n minus one or 10 minus one, which will give us nine. Then we can go to our table, and we go to the row of nine, and our significance level here optional was 0 0.10. So from there, we can find the p. And here they said the p gave us 0 0.1054. Again, we will see the next slide how we get the p-value. But we can see that if the significant level is 0 0.10 and our p-value is 0 0.1054, it means the p is greater than the alpha or the significant level. So we cannot reject HO, we have to accept. So we say the weak evidence against HO. Now let's see how they find the p. So here we have the table C, which is again the T distribution table. And the T p-value through the table C, we wedge the T start between critical value landmark on the T table, one tail point P should be less than one, 0 0.10 or greater than 0 
that's for one tail. But we are doing two tail. Two tail means we multiply by two. So the P should be less than 0 0.10, uh, greater than 0 0.10 and less than 0 0.20. So what we do is that we have our T table here. Our degree of freedom was nine. Degree of freedom was nine. So and also the P value and uh, the T value was negative 1.8. So here we go to the degree of freedom nine. Then we look for our value. So P value through the user software to, to determine T. Uh, so here again, we have the degree of freedom to be nine. And then the T value was, uh, let's go back first. Oh, I'm going forward. Negative, the T start was negative 1.8. So here we can see that again, we go to degree of freedom, which is nine, but 1.8 fall between 1.383 and 1.833. So here we need to, choose one option here. So we decided again to choose the 0 0.10, the tail to tail will give you 0 0.154. And this is for using the software. So it will fall somewhere 1.80 here. So the next step now, we know the p-value, we combine the area in both tails. We have 0 0.0, we are doing two tails. So we have the t start to be negative 1.8. We have to have the positive 1.8 side. And then we find the p-value here. We use the computer give us 0 0.1054. Half of it will give us 0 0.0527. The table will give a 0 0.10, we'll have to give a 0 0.05 in both directions. Uh, so the next section is confidence interval for the mean. Now we did the confidence interval, I think in chapter eight or nine. The whole concept is here. Yeah, the confidence interval is approximately, we have 95% chance that our mean value will be between 100 to 150. So confidence interval is to give us some percentage that we are sure our answer will fall between. Instead of saying that, okay, the mean is 32, I'll say we have 95% chance and confidence that the mean will be from 30 to 35. So how do we find a confidence interval? It depends on the percentage. So if I'm looking for 95% confidence interval, the alpha will be 5%, which is 0 0.05. If I'm looking for 90% confidence, confidence interval, the alpha will be 10% or 0 0.1. So the formula will be one minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for mean. We give me S bar plus or minus T, the degree of freedom N minus one, then one minus alpha over two. Remember in a Z, confidence interval, we use the same one minus half over two. With the T also the same thing. Now the difference here is that with the T table, we need the row, which is the degree of freedom. So here we will know the degree of freedom. We know the probability P, so we are going to look for T. So again, to find the confidence interval for mean, which will be again one minus if it's uh, one minus alpha times hundred percent means if the alpha for example is five percent then here we get ninety five percent confidence interval if the alpha is twenty percent then we get eighty percent confidence interval and it will be the sample mean plus or minus the t degree of freedom n minus one and the alpha significant level which will give us the p one minus alpha over two times the standard error but remember we are using the sample standard deviation for this is t distribution so here we say the typical point estimate plus or minus margin of error formula 
which is the T n minus one, one minus alpha of R2, is from the T table. This is similar to Z proceed, except we are using, again, sample standard deviation instead of population standard deviation. Also, it's similar to Z procedure, Z procedure, except that we are using T table instead of Z table. So again, the formula is S bar plus or minus T, N minus one, comma, one minus alpha over two. Anytime we are looking for the value for T, in a, when we are looking for value for Z, all we need to know is the P value. But when we are looking for the value for T, if we have the p-value, we still need the degree of freedom because the degree of freedom will take us to the row that we have to go. Then times the standard error. Standard error, again, will be the sample standard deviation over the sample size. So this is an example here. Here they say, let us calculate 95% confidence interval for mean for the birth weight of SIDS babies. So we know the sample mean given to us to be 2890.5. The sample standard deviation is 720. And also we know the sample size is 10. So to find the 95% confidence interval for the mean, it will be X bar plus or minus T. Again, the sample size is 10. So the degree of freedom will be 10 minus one. And also the alpha is point, uh, this is 95% confidence interval. So the alpha will be 0 0.05, which is 5%. Now, if I'm looking for 90% confidence interval, then alpha will be 10%, which is 0 0.10. So we are using 1 minus 0 0.05 over 2. Alpha is 5% or 0 0.05 because we are looking for 95% confidence interval. Times again, the sample standard deviation over square root of sample size, which is the standard error. So we plug in the value 2090.5 plus or minus. We look at our table, we go to the ninth row and we look for the value here. This value should give us a 10.975, I'm not 100% sure. But again, whatever the P we get here, we go to the column and look for that P. And we should get 2.262. Then the sample standard deviation is 720. The sample size is 10. So when we had everything, when we do our arithmetic here, we will get the interval 2375.4 to 340.5.6. Everything here, 2.262 times 720 over square root of 10 will give me 515.1. Then I'm going to add and subtract 515.1 to 2890.5. So that give me 2375.4 to 3405.6. So this is a second example here. We said data are percent. Data are percent of our dear body weight in 18 diabetes. So they give us the body weight for 18 diabetes here. Based on this data, we calculated, we want to calculate 95 confidence interval for the mean. So the sample here is given. When we find a sample mean of all these data set, we get 112.778. When the data is given, we can find the standard deviation. So the sample standard deviation is 14.424. How do we find the standard deviation? We already have the mean. Subtract so the mean from each value, square it and add all together, and divide by the sample minus one then find the square root of that value. And that will give you again the standard deviation for the sample. So finding for a standard deviation for a sample, when you have only data, first you find the mean of the data set. You subtract the mean from each value, then you square each, the difference, the answer you get for each value, you square it, then you add all together. Then you divide by the sample size minus one. And the final answer will be the square root of that result. So we know the sample size is 18 because 18 data was given. So to find the standard error, we already know the sample standard deviation, which is 14.242 to 
we divide by square root of the sample size, which is 18, and that gives us 3.4. So now we know the standard error, we know the sample mean, we know the sample standard deviation, we know the sample size. So we can find the t n minus one and one minus alpha over two. Our confidence interval here is not is ninety five percent. So which means alpha will be five percent, which is 0 0.05. So you can see we plug in eighteen minus one n minus one, then one minus 0 0.05 over two. So this will give me degree of freedom will be seventeen. And one minus 0 0.05 over two will give me 0.975. So now I'll go to the table. I'll look at the 17 degree of freedom. That is the 17th row. And I'll look for the column for 0.975. And that gives us roughly 2.110. So if I know that T, N minus one, and one minus alpha over two, now I can find the confidence interval 95%. It will be the, the mean sample, which is 112.778 plus or minus the T value, which is the T N minus one and one minus half over two, which was 2.110 times the standard error, which is 3.44. So here we get 112.778 plus or minus 7.17. So our 95% confidence interval on this data set, we subtract 7.15 from 112.778. That will be the lower limit. Then we had 7.17 again to 112.778. And that will give, give us the upper limit. So our answer will be 105.6 to 120. So next, and the T distribution also make it possible for us to test two samples if they are the same or whatever we want to test. But we can also use, so here we say pair samples. We have to, now if I have more than two samples to test, most likely I will use the ANOVA. That's the analysis of the uh, variance. So the pair sample will say that each point in one sample is matched to a unique point in the other sample which means the sample size must be the same. So they must be dependent. And then pairs B achieve true sequential samples within individuals. So example would be a pretest and post-test. If I have, I want to test, uh, let's say, uh, a, golf, a golf club. And our test here is saying that there's a claim that when a golf club gets older, it doesn't give us a good score when we use it in playing golf. So I'll buy one golf club, brand new. I will take a data when I was using it as new. Then maybe after a year or two years, maybe it's old now, I may take this, use it and take the data about the performance of it. This data set, and we have two samples, but these two samples, they are dependent because we are using the same club. The size of the data is the same. Sometimes also we can do a test on two or more samples that are independent. And here we're not going to use the T distribution, we use a different distribution. So the pairs be achieved through sequential sample within individual Example would be pretests and posters or crossover trials or match procedures, also called match pairs or dependent samples. Again, the data must be dependent samples. So this is an example. Let's see how this works. Here we say a study addresses whether hot brand reduce LDL cholesterol with a crossover design. Subjects crossover from a conflict diet to an oat brand diet. So you can see that this is dependent data because we have one subject or one person use the conflict. After a while, it changes to oat brand diet. So this is dependent variable. Now, if we have two people and one person use the conflict or take the conflict 
and another take the old Brian. This will be independent sample because they are two separate. So with the T distribution, we want to make sure our sample two samples are dependent. Now here we say that half subject start on conflict, then half on old brand. Two weeks on diet one, they measure the LDL cholesterol. The washout period, then they switch the diet. Two weeks also they measure the LDL. So again, we are using the same subject, so it's a dependent variable. So this is the data we collected for their measurement for the LDL uh, cholesterol. We have 12 subjects. We can see first conflict 4.61. When you want to hold brand, it was 3.84, 6.42, 5.57. our goal is to test if the type of whether conflict or old brand may have effect on the LDL cholesterol. So calculate the difference. First of all, we're going to calculate the difference variable. Again, here we are using two pair, two sample. So step one is to create difference variable data, which will be the conflict minus the old brand. So we have conflict, old brand, then we have data. Then the order of a subtraction does not materialize effect result, effect result, but does not change sign of differences. So this is the three observation, 4.61 minus 3.84 will give me 0.77. 6.42 minus 5.57 will give me 0.85. Then 5.0 minus 5.85 will give me negative 0 0.45. So we do that throughout the values, 18 values. Now here are all the 12 pair differences data. Uh, again, here the size of the data is 12. So we have 12 all the differences. We use the stem plot to see the distribution. So we can see that there's a slight negative skew. Negative skew means again, we are going to the left, we skew to the left. Now the data values are given, then the subscript, they will be used to denote the statistics for different variable data. So we know N is 12 again. We find the mean of the data, the difference which give us 0 0.3808. Then we find a standard deviation of the same data value, which give us 0 0.4335. Again, to find the standard deviation, subtract each value from the mean, which for example, 0 0.77 minus 0 0.3808. Then you square the answer. Then you add it to the next value, which will be the same thing to find the difference and uh, square. Then we add all together, then we divide by the sample size minus one. And that to give us the variance. To find the standard deviation, we find the square root of that value. So right now we did that and we have the sample size. We have the, the sample mean for the data value, we have the standard deviation for the data value. So we can do our testing now. So the T procedure directed towards the data variable calculate the confidence interval for the mean. So we have one minus alpha 100% confidence interval for mean D will be the sample D plus or minus T N minus one, one minus alpha over two times the sample standard deviation of the data over square root of the sample size, which is 12. So we know 95 confidence in the interval, the alpha will be 0.05. The size is 12, so 12 minus one, which is degree of freedom, comma, then one minus 0 0.05 over two, we give us the P. So from the table, we may find out that we go to row 11 and we look for the P of 9.975, which is the column, we will get 2.201. So if I know the T value, then I'm going to have 
the sample mean plus or minus the t value times the standard error of the d. So doing this calculation, we get 0.2754. So we are going to subtract 0.2754 from 0.3808. That will be the lower limit. And we had it 0.2754 to 0.3808, and that will be our upper limit. So our confidence interval here is 95% confidence that our mean will be between 0.105 to 0.656. So again, this is simple t-test. It's similar to one sample t-test. We need to state our HO and HA. Then we do our test that it is. We can see that the formula is the same, but since we are using the pair value, we find the difference, the data, then later we find the S bar data, then we find the standard deviation of the data. The formula is the same, but instead of, if it's one value, we use the sample mean of that value. But if it's two paired, then we find the difference of the two, and that's what we are using. Still, we need to find the degree of freedom. So the hypothesis testing, we say that MD is zero. MD is not zero. So T star to give me X bar D minus M zero over sample standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size, which will be 0 0.38083 minus zero over 0 0.4335 divided by square root of 12. And by the T star to be 3.043, we need a degree of freedom. So degree of freedom will be N minus one, which is 12 minus one, 11. So if we know the degree of freedom and we know the T value, we can find the P. Using the computer, we said the P is 0 0.011. We can see that the P is very small. Or we can go to the T table. We go to the row 11, degree of freedom 11. Then we look for our uh, value, uh, which is on the row 11, we are looking for 3.043. Most likely, we will not get 3.043, but any value that is very close to it, that's what we're going to use to get the P. So if the P is 0 0.011 and the alpha is 0 0.05, this time we have enough evidence to go against HO or to reject HO because the P value is very small. So this will be the output if we are using SPSS. We have the T to be 3.043, degree of freedom is 11. We are using the two tail and our value is 0 0.011. Also the mean difference was found for us. The confidence in the interval they give us the lower and the upper side. So we have some conditions for inference uh, when we are doing T distribution. So here we say T procedure require these conditions. First, our sample must be simple random sample. It must be randomly selected. Then second, the valid information. No information, information bias. The information has to be valid. Then you have to be normal population or large sample which is the central limit theorem. So the normality condition, we say the normality condition normally applies to the sampling distribution of the mean, not the population. Therefore, it is okay to use the T distribution when the population is normal, when the population is not normal, but is symmetrical. And N is at least five to 10. The population also is skewed, and the end is at, the, at least 30 to 100, depending on the extent of the skew. So here we have an example here. The example said, can a T procedure be used? Our first data set, we can see that the end is six, and the data is flat. So we say data A is skewed and small, so we avoid the T procedure because the sample size is only six. 
but with database T as a mild skew and it's moderate in size. We can use T procedure here. The size is 25 and it's mild against skew. It's almost normal distribution. But the first one is on normal distribution and also the sample size way small, so we are going to the T test. Now in data set C, it's highly skewed. We can see to the right, highly skewed. And it's very small, the size is 13. So we also avoid the T distribution. Normally T distribution will be good if the sample size is big and also the distribution is normal curve or close to normal curve. So the next section is what is a sample size and a power? This is a very important in our testing hypothesis, especially when we are dealing with the T testing. We need to consider the sample size. When the sample size is very small, we always avoid the T distribution. Also, the power will tell us the power of the test, given whatever condition we have. So sample size and power will answer questions like, how big a sample is needed to limit the margin of error to M. So we want to have enough sample size that will limit our error, or most likely even if it can eliminate the error, but most of the time, no, but to limit the margin of error. Or how big a sample is needed to test the HO with one manual's better power at significant level alpha. So how big the sample is needed to test HO with power at significant level alpha. And the last question is, what is the power of a test given certain conditions? So a sample size, we normally have the confidence interval. So we say a one minus alpha, 100% confidence interval for mean, or the mean D, the difference, to M, the sample size should be no less than N equal to Z1 minus alpha over two, population standard deviation divided by the margin of error, everything square. So this is the formula where you can see that this formula is the confidence interval formula. We transform it to find the N. Remember N is a square root of N. So that's why later we square root it. So alpha will be, of course, the significance level. M will be the margin of error. Then the sigma will be the population standard deviation. Now, when N is greater than or equal to 30, because T plus, uh, T plus, which is the degree of freedom, and one minus alpha will be approximately one minus alpha over two. And when n is less than 30, we apply adjustment factor f degree of freedom plus three divided by degree of freedom plus one to compensate between z and t. So when the sample size is greater than or equal to 30, our z, t becomes almost z. So that's what we said earlier, when the sample size increases, the t distribution T becomes skinner like Z distribution. Uh, when it's less than 30, the T normal distribution it still becomes more broader, which leads to the uncertainty. But as the sample size increases, the margin of error will decrease and the T distribution becomes almost easy distribution, normal curve with Skinner tails. So this is the formula to find a sample size requirement. N is the population standard deviation square, Z1 minus beta, which is the power of test, plus Z1 minus alpha over two, square divided by delta square, the, the difference. The data square normally is the mu zero minus mu a or mu o minus, that would be the difference what detecting. Population standard deviation is the sigma. Then desired significant level. 
and one minus half one minus beta is the desired power of test, which is z one minus beta. So for one sided test, we use the z one minus alpha in place of z one minus alpha over two in the formula. Now for pair t test, we use the standard deviation data difference because pair means we have two samples. So when we get the population of both of them, we find the difference and use that in place of standard deviation. We can still apply the adjustment factor f which is degree of freedom plus three divided by degree of freedom plus one, when the sample size is less than or equal to 30 to compensate for the difference between Z and T. So this is also our power formula, which is one minus beta. So our theta negative Z, one minus half over two plus absolute value of the difference. So difference always up to the order delta always have to be positive times square root of n over standard devi deviation for the population. So again, alpha is our two-sided alpha level of test. The difference, the main difference, what to detecting, which is our delta, and lowercase n is our sample size. Sigma will be our standard deviation in the population. And then the theta z is the cumulative probability of z on the standard normal distribution. So here, by looking at the formula z1 minus alpha over two, we are going to use the z table, not the t table. So this is an example again from the same babies with SIDS. So one minus alpha over two here, we are looking for 95% confidence interval. So negative z1 minus alpha over two will give us point Z.975, which will give us 1.96, but it's negative, so we'll put the negative down. And the total difference is 300. The sample size is 10 square root of 10. And the standard deviation for the population was 720. So here we use the Z table, and finally we get 0.2611. So the power is about 26%. So this will be the conclusion of our unit 11 lectures. Again, this lecture will learn about how to use the T distribution table. Um, and also T distribution table is when, if it's only one set of sample, is when we don't know the population standard deviation. Now, if we have a pair set of sample, we cannot use Z test, we use the T distribution also. So again, wish everybody the best and thank you for your time.